Welcome to the latest in our series of Top Med Talks 2. In these podcasts, the Top Med Talk team is in conversation with global thought leaders in perioperative care. Top Med Talk. I have called a special guest, Professor John Myberg, who's in Sydney in Australia. John has been a stalwart of the great world fluid debate uh, held at the annual meeting, the EBPOM meeting in London each year. And John's been coming to us for a number of years now. And as a result of that, uh, possibly, he's conducted some of the largest trials in the world trying to resolve the great world fluid debate. So, so John, how are you? Very well, Monty. And may I say that I was gutted not to be there at EBPOM, my first miss in uh, the other 10 years. And... Uh, I followed the uh, conference online and it looked as usual as an exit meeting. Excellent. Thank you, John. John, can you, not everyone will know you as well as I know you. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your current roles? Thanks, Mike. Well, um, I'm a intensive care physician. I worked in Australia for, you know, in ICU for over 30 years, 35 years. We really came in South Africa. But uh, working in a major adult mixed ICU for that period of time. Um, but I guess my expert clinical work has been involved in high-level research, but uh, in this space, already conducting high-grade clinical trials, mainly comparative effectiveness trials, looking at standard uh, interventions and working out the efficacy and safety of what we do every day. The launch pad of these big trials we did, of course, was a safe study, and uh, that was when our our relationship really began, um, presenting the outcome of the 7,000 patient saline versus fluid evaluation, which was conducted in response to the Cochrane analysis that Ian Roberts published in BMJ in 1999. And from that safe study, we then conducted a whole series of other fluid trials, looking at various fluid types, uh, hydroxyethyl starch and saline, and we're currently running arm of the trilogy, which is the um, PLUS study, which is a plasmolite versus saline study. And that's been my fluid um, research activities over the last 15 years. And that puts almost everyone else's efforts in, into a, a, a dark in the shadows. That's an incredible effort there, John. So, so John, what do you think, it, just a headline summary, is the takeaway from your previous trials? We'll come back to the, the current trial in a moment. But what do you think are the big takeaways from the previous one? What do we know about albumin in the context of the critically ill now? Well, I think the important thing is that when you interpret these large comparative effectiveness trials, people often misinterpret or perhaps misrepresent what these trials were about. I mean, these trials were designed to answer one question, yes. designed primarily to address safety and efficacy of one shirt versus the other. Because in both the Albumin trials and the STARS trials, there were very real questions raised about the safety and efficacy of the Albumin yes. posed by Cochrane. And, and quite and serious. They, very, they, they suggest that it was really quite dangerous. I mean, almost toxic. Yeah. Wasn't it? Well, the, the meta-analysis that Ian Roberts published a long time ago, and that was done the last century, and perhaps not conducted the same level of rigor that we would do one nowadays. Um, but the important thing about that meta-analysis was that it posed a question that Albumin was associated with a 6% increase in death in patients. And that's a very big effect size. Um, and we used Cochrane's study, the Cochrane study, to power our trial to do a study looking at half the effect size of 3%. And that was informed by the Cochrane analysis. And that's why we did a 7,000 patient trial. And we basically answered the question that Albumin and Thalon did not increase mortality in a large population of ICU patients. And that was the point of safe. You know, you obviously get insights into mechanisms and into patient subgroups, which is the a good thing of these trials, but those are always, always hypothesis generating. Mm. But what we found was that there was no difference in mortality between Almond and, and Saline. That can be interpreted that it's safe to use or that Saline, saline is equi effective. Yes. It doesn't say that one's better than the other. Yes. But it informed a, an informed a clinical question. But I think the key thing about safe was that for the first time, in the context of a blinded, randomized, controlled, pragmatic study in conducting real life conditions, began to question a lot of the benefits that we thought were attributable to colloids. Yes. Specifically, the uh, crystalloid sparing effect of colloids. Yep. The old 3 to 1 ratio clearly is not, is not true. And this has now come out with a number of trials that done in different settings. And the equi effective crystalloid colloid ratio for 
commonly used hemodynamic endpoints at about 1.4 to 1. Yes. So these, these solutions don't really uh, provide a lot of sparing. And in parallel, we've had tremendous insights into the glycocalyx and yep. uh, the impact of, of those mechanistic issues. And these, these observations accord with understandings in, in that. And that, I think, is probably the biggest contribution of the big uh, colloid trials to our current practice. It was raised in the Great World Fluid Debate this year briefly. I know you have to be careful with subsets, but there was a signal of possible harm in the trauma subset. And, and is that enough to uh, say if there's a signal of harm, you should stay away from using such fluids? The subset was particular to traumatic brain injury. Yes. Um, that was an important subset because the, the safe study was stratified by both of trauma yep. to make sure that we equal balance. Yes. And that was an important consideration in interpreting that subgroup. So we had 3,500 patients in each group, and that was stratified for aggressive trauma because there was uncertainty. Yes. And the overall mortality from trauma was very low, as you would expect. The main driver of death in that group of patients was due to TBI, traumatic yes. brain injury. Yes. We then saw a striking difference in mortality in patients to receive albumin compared to saline. Yeah. And that effect size was quite large, and we drilled down in that in a postdoc analysis, and we acknowledge that fact this was not powerful at it. And looked at it very carefully because of the concerns we had. And in fact, we showed in some quite sophisticated modeling that this was attributable to an increase in ICP yes. used at Alvin. What's become sort of not that clear is whether that was attributable to Alvin per se, yeah. or whether it was due to the hypotonic concentration of Alvin that we used. Yes. And my view is that it's probably a mixture of both. But the effect size that we observed in a very large subset was enough to advise caution yes. in these patients. But in fact, you know, it may well be that the extravasation of the albumin or colloids into um, you know, the brain tissue may in fact be harmful. And I guess I would love to do a trial like that yeah. <laughs> to answer the question, but there would be very serious ethical concerns about getting consent for this. Yes. And, and John, so the, the, so with that, albumin, we, of, we often don't know the electrolyte unless it's different with you, we often don't know the electrolyte composition of the, or we don't concentrate on the electrolyte composition of the, of the crystalloid component of the colloid. Insofar that the solution that we used was opposite albumin and normal saline. In, in, so, they were, they were, so 154 of sodium and 154 yeah. of chloride, because that's not always what we get here when we, when we look at it more closely. Or is that what you had at your end? No, no, that's correct. Um, but the carrier field is saline. And, okay. and you're right, the concentration may be an important issue as well. Web evidence to date uh, would suggest that saline is the sort of choice for traumatic brain injury. Yep. But we talked later about the saline versus bad and salt solution trials. We can perhaps address that further on uh, in terms of whether or not that is actually true. Yes. So, so then um, if we just before we get to that one, jump very briefly to chest because we've talked about this a lot in the past. Yeah. Some very important yeah. messages from that. So, your, your headline again of what you think chest told us in the context of the other trials that went on around the time yeah. Yeah. well the hydroxy of starch uh, story has been fascinating it's been going on for over 10 years now yep. and it's generated a lot of publicity and press and partisan views and reactions from industry and reactions from medical regulatory authorities and there's a tremendous story and there's no doubt that your meeting was a very important vehicle to express those opinions and uh, that's an important contribution bottom line is i think there's now compelling evidence that the use of synthetic colloids, particularly hydroxy ethyl starch, for the simple reason that this is the preparation that we studied the most, is associated with adverse patient-centered outcomes with no significant benefit of, at all. And that alone, in my view, is enough to seriously question their use in current clinical practice. They cause adverse effect or harm, particularly uh, kidney injury, which... It, the debate has been long and hard about that and how you quantify that. But, but our view is that if you're going to measure this, it has to be compassion centered. And the only one that is important, really, is the use of renal replacement therapy and not surrogate uh, scoring yes. systems. And again, the chest study in particular was an important contribution to that debate, even though the debate got, got quite heated. The use of scoring systems to quantify renal injury. Yes. And this is germane to the SMART studies as well. Yes. Is not, in my view, a patient deductive. Right. That's, that's related to how the patient feels, functions, and survives. And the requirement for dialysis, in my view, is the key metric. 
And I think that is the, the key outcome from chess and, in fact, with the success studies that the exposing people to starch, for which there is a strong biological mechanistic uh, process, uh, expose them to increased risk of the need for dialysis. And in my view, that is a very serious consideration why you should not give patients to these products. Uh, same, I have the same view of yes. the same view of the gelatin, purely on a extrapolation basis, and I acknowledge that there is no equivalent trial. Yeah. But the biological processes by which you are infusing foreign substances produced, you know, from gelatin and from potatoes and from mazes in crystalloid vectors, which accumulate in tissues, cannot be physiologically dependent, in my view. So, John, what what did the long term follow up show? Because we're, we're dealing, we're discussing at the moment the relief trial, you know, the restrictive versus liberal, led yeah. by Paul yeah. Miles trial, and again, one of the primary outcome variables that was different in the two groups there was so-called AKI, but included in that was statistically significant difference in the use of renal replacement therapy in the patients in the yep. restricted, which was more of a zero balance group. Now, they're, they're proposing yep. to yep. do a long term, a long, long term follow up uh, with Ronaldo yep. Bomo, who you know very well, etc. I think that's what yep. Paul, etc. are trying to see if they can get funded at the moment. What, what did you find in, in chest and long term follow ups in critical care patients we know is extremely difficult to, to separate the signals? Yes. So the chest long-term follow-up was, was, was pre-specified. It was done not dissimilar to what Andy Shaw's group did, uh, they had built using, uh, using uh, registered data. We had yep. uh, six months, I mean, which we had measured with direct assessments, looking at uh, tools, and then looked at mortality at 24 months. Yes. And taking those in, in sequence, we did a quality of life, just a lot of years using the different tools we used. Yep. Um, and we, 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 we saw no difference between the starch group and the salon group. And that was the best metric that we had to do that. Similarly, there was no difference in mortality at two years between the two groups, which isn't surprising, given yes. that there was more difference in mortality at, at three months. So that didn't really surprise us. The main objective for that study was twofold. First was to test the robustness of the outcome metric yep. using qualities and luckier, luckier gains. And remember that, a bit like the renal story, these metrics aren't specifically designed to quantify long-term outcomes in ICU patients. A very prominent journal uh, that we both know is very reluctant to publish these kind of analyses on the grounds that the metrics that we use to quantify this are not that robust. Yes. These studies will inform better metrics and pre-plan to how we can really adjust, we can assess long-term outcomes that are patient-centered. Right. Which go, which go beyond the eq 5 d 301 so I'm not, I'm not criticizing my own trial. We did the best, best outcome measures we had available. The results are reported as they, as they stand. The second thing which goes in with that is health economics. Because on the one hand, you have to have patient-centered outcomes. The second one is health economics. And we showed, not surprisingly, that there were, there were greater costs incurred with patients who, um, who received starch compared to saline. And these are mainly due to increased uh, costs in the ICU which again uh, concurs with the, what the trial shows. And I think those are the important contributions of this long-term outcome study that published in the Lancet, which add to the debate. And certainly the trial that we're doing now, looking at long-term follow-ups, will focus on probably more robust outcome metrics that we can measure at different intervals and looking at better, better costings uh, for patients, uh, looking at micro-costings and, and basically um, healthcare costings. So whilst there's a big push to do these long-term outcome studies, and they're very, very, very important, the key focus, in my view, is to remember that anything you're measuring has to be an assessment that is robust of how the patient feels, functions, and survives. Yes. And mm. the current metrics that we have at this point in time, I would submit, don't really reflect that. Well, they're the best we've got. And I've discussed this with people, and we need to take the lessons learned from these trials, like CHEST and those ones, and then perhaps make these make these outcome measures more robust and more and more applicable to our patients. Right. And in parallel with that is matching that that to what the costs the community. And I guess one of the final comments I make about that is that looking at costing studies and outcome studies, these have to be interpreted within the context in which these trials were conducted. In Australia, where you have universal, universal healthcare, as you do in the United Kingdom, there are some comparisons there. But the comparison that's coming out of the United States, for example, or perhaps Eastern Europe or in places which is user pays, um, those costings are quite different. And that, that generalizability needs to be considered very carefully. 
So one of the points raised with Paul Miles about his trial is if the there's a difference in short-term outcomes, like the use of uh, haemofiltration, acute kidney injury infections, but there's no difference in, and he chose disability-free one-year survival. Yep. The, the, the short-term mm-hmm. outcome is, I don't believe this, the, the short-term outcome is a bit of a ho-hum finding. It doesn't really inform us when we're trying to make big decisions. Now, I believe the short-term outcomes do relate to long-term outcomes, but it takes a long time for them to come to fruition. And as you say, we need very robust, validated measures to be able to detect that signal. So what do you say to those people who say, well, so what, that there was a transient difference in the use of haemofiltration because it didn't translate into any meaningful long-term outcome? Do you all say it's the robustness of the measure? Well, that's a very important comment, uh, Monty, yeah. and as usual, I'll agree with you yeah. on that point. Um, again, it comes down to the robustness of the metrics. Yeah. I think one of the biggest contributions to the literature in that context was the long-term follow-up that we did of the renal study. Yes. Now, the renal study, as you will recall, was a large trial comparing different doses of hemodiphyltration in pretty sick patients. The mortality rate in that group was over 40%. Yes. And we compared 25 mils per kilo per hour versus 40 mils per kilo per hour and the outcome measure was day 90, yes. and there was no difference, which would suggest that a lower TST dialysis mode done in Australia, which is a different practice to the US perhaps, uh, didn't, it didn't prove outcome, and therefore a more cost-effective way to do that. The important thing about that study was we did a long-term follow-up for four years yep. in the survivors. And I think that the real study told us two things. The first thing is that the mortality rate in patients who require dialysis is higher than patients who don't. Yes. It's a really major insult to patients. And secondly, patients who survive that incur long-term renal damage, Yes, which, which persists for a long time. There is objective measurements of, of renal injury, albuminuria. There is an increased incidence of use of chronic dialysis mm-hmm. and a much higher mortality rate, which, which, which presents later in life. Now, this is specific to a patient population of critically ill. Yes. There are clearly pre-morbid factors at play here. There may be the additional burden of the insult that occurred, occurred and some of the treatments. Yes. And I think that's the kind of population where this insult would be exposed. In these surgical patients, which in Paul's excellent study, okay, these are patients undergoing major surgery. Yep. The event rate for renal failure mortality was very low, yes. which is why they chose to use their composite endpoint measure. Yep. And I think that a signal which shows a transient or short-term increase in renal patient therapy, which is potentially avoidable, is a really important signal. Yeah. But the question is this. If you're going to consent the patient to, an op- to, a, to, a, to a procedure, yes. you need to disclose them. Now, you expose them to a high risk of requiring one of the most burdensome interventions in, in practice, which is potentially avoidable. It's a bit like giving patients starch. Yes. I wouldn't expose a patient to get a bag of starch with the smallest increased risk of, of, of requiring dialysis. Yeah. And the same thing applies here. You've got to be, got to be careful. And... You know, what concerns me about the, the relief trial is how, how this trial is interpreted and, and then promoted or, 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 or discussed. It doesn't mean to say that, that you can now give lots and lots of sure to patients. Yes. Because, you know, there's a lower rate. It's very carefully done. It, it's personalized medicine and it's done with less fear. The volumes are much, much lower than beforehand. Yeah. But giving a, a super restrictive approach may in fact not be the, the way we, we thought it was. And the relief trial is a very important contribution to literature in terms of how we carefully use this. There's no doubt in my view that this trial, a bit like um, uh, the classic trial that uh, Peter Hortchett published, the pilot trial, yes. used the question how we give fluids. And fluids need to be done very carefully on a personalised basis, uh, integrating all the results, all the major comparative effectiveness trials and the process of care trials, such as, um, such as Paul's trial, in the big patient population. So, so uh, I, th- I get in, I, sorry, John. I get the impression that you, uh, as I do, think that Paul's proposal with Ronaldo, Baloma, etc., to do a long-term follow on these up on these patients would be a significant contribution to our understanding of the meaning of these shorter-term signals. Yeah, I would, but I think to increase the return on on the back would be yeah. to identify patients who are at higher risk. Okay, okay. Good you, know, um, you know, the ones who have pre-existing renal dysfunction, yeah. patients who perhaps have major blood loss, I'm, I'm speaking off the cuff here, uh, yes. you know, yeah. uh, septic patients, emergency surgery, age, age patients, because there's no doubt that there are patients who are at higher risk and in whom a difference could be determined. 
So just a couple more questions from you, John. You've been very generous with your time. You mentioned oh, your e- ethical concerns of exposing patients to hydroxyethyl starch during elective surgery, for example. Now, uh, in, in our colloid crystalloid discussion, um, where in the follow-up we asked Mark Edwards, who was on the panel, um, who's one of our national clinical trialists, and, and Paul Miles, who we've just been discussing, Tim Miller asked them both if they thought in the context of elective surgery, if the colloid crystalloid question was still alive, and you can listen to it online, they thought very much it is, and the trials need to be done. Now, if the trials were to be done, I, I'm guessing that you'd need to ask the question about albumin, you'd need to ask the question about starches, you'd need to ask the question about gelatins. Now, gelatins have never been approved in the USA for concerns about the safety of using them, as I understand. Starches, you've just expressed the concerns that are there about starches. And albumin might make a tight brain tighter. And if you're doing, for example, long-term, in other words, lengthy laparoscopic head-down tilt surgeries, robotic surgeries, we know the brain gets swollen. So we can all construct paradigms whereby we'd have significant concerns about each of those fluids. So A, do you think it's an important question, as they believe, in the context of elective surgery to be checked off? And B, do you think it would be ethical to do them? I mean, obviously, very important questions. I mean, I'll take a reductionist view. I would have grave concerns in doing a synthetic colloid trial uh, in those patients. I think there's enough evidence now to really question the ethics of doing a starch versus saline or plasma light solution in any patient group. I think you're exposing patients to unnecessary risk. Okay. And uh, if you do that, you, you, you need to disclose that quite clearly to the patient. Yeah. And this has been the subject of deliberations with the various medical regulatory authorities. The, the drug manufacturers have been charged with producing trials. To answer this question, I've seen that a few of these trials, they are not close to getting to answer this question in terms of the uh, design. Um, and uh, I just think that there's enough evidence, in my view, to really question the ethics of that. And I certainly would have grave concerns about putting patient of mine into that kind of trial. So I can That's my view, and I know. Yeah, I can sympathise with the regulators here, though, John, because if the trials have never been done to answer the question, and we want the evidence to know if they're safe, but you don't think it's ethical to do the trials, that does seem like catch-22 to me. It is, but the point is that the reason why we did those trials in the yeah. ICU context is because you the sickest patients to the, the intervention. Sure. Uh, and, and there was a dose response there. There's a production response there. Uh, you know, and it's Turner's trial, and people always talk about the old starch trial saying it was unethical, it had, it had too much fluid, out of context. But that was standard practice at the time. Sure, sure. And we've now got quite a nice dose response, you know, relationship between giving these fluids to patients. And and um, I just can't see how, you know, a general population of ICU patients or patients with septic shock exposed to stuff can somehow be different to patients who are having okay. surgery. Okay, so we'll, particularly we'll, given the insight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so we'll, 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 loop, we'll loop back on that in a second, John, because you know I've, okay. I've, as I've said before, that I'm not convinced that doing saline interventional trials is ethical because there's enough signals there to suggest harm. But so let's tuck yeah. the starch away for yeah. a second. What do you do about the albumin and the gelatin? Because there is, you know, well, if, yeah. if, if there is concerns about albumin. Are there, are there are concerns. There's concerns about everything. We have to be honest. They're all drugs, and there are definite yeah, concerns about gelatins. Would you? Would you? Do you think we should do one of those trials or, or both those together in some sort of factorial design? I think they're quite different. I mean, yeah. take gelatins first. Again, I accept without any reservations that the trials have been done in gelatin. Yeah. The evidence is pretty thin. The most of it is pre and post studies and all the, all the trials that the devil the starts the industry beforehand, yeah. protagonist driven, and you can get any results you want. I just find on a mechanistic basis that a synthetic foreign substance which doesn't necessarily produce the purported colloidal beneficial effects is a good idea. What about um, albumin? And, um, what about albumin? So al- so Albumin's al- very so expensive and still used in bucket loads. Yeah, I, I, would, I would certainly have con- the same concerns about gelatin, but I accept the evidence in there to justify that statement. Okay. And I think ethically you could get it passed. With the guys the albumin story as well, because of the logistics, the impurities, the expense, the cost. But I would say that's something worth considering. I would model it on a similar sort of comparative effectiveness strategy. Uh, it needs to be pragmatic, it needs to be real life, um, uh, and uh, I think there's a case for that. I just think that, again, I would ask people to carefully think about it in terms of what outcomes do you use to quantify the effect. As it's patient-centered, you need to have a big enough trial to look at a, at a reasonable effect size, 
And I think it'll be a difficult trial to do because the event rates you're talking about in these patients is very low. With regards to your extrapolation of the paradigm of patients being tilted down and, and getting you know, brain swelling from that, I think that's a very long bow. Yeah. And I don't think that there's enough evidence to, to restrict the albumin in those patients. I think the you know it comes down to uh, a loss of brain barrier integrity, uh, extrapolation of the albumin in high doses, I think that's a very different, a very different um, uh, context uh, in TBI if the surgery. So I think you know, if you wanted to do that in those patients, you could consider it. And the penultimate bit before we get to the saline versus balanced solutions, plasma light, Hartmann's, etc. And it overlaps with that. Do you think you could answer or try and get a, a bigger clue about if there is true advantages, both efficacy, safety, etc.? with albumin by doing a similar trial, in other words, a a cluster, an in-house cluster randomised trial that they did in Vanderbilt to to try and answer the albumin uh, crystalloid question. Would that be a a, cost-effective way of doing it? I think it would. Actually, the Vanderbilt trial was an outstanding trial. It was very, very good, very well done. And I think that would be a very effective way of doing that in that context, uh, in the cluster study with perhaps an adaptive design. I think that kind of thing would be feasible that, in that context. Um, I think that's, that, in that context, I think that would be a much more feasible way of doing answering the question. And perhaps even doing, you know, if you want to be even more adventurous, uh, some kind of adaptive design or some kind of factorial design incorporating restrictive and liberal uh, strategies. Uh, that would be a very powerful trial to answer that question. So I think the parallel group, you know, big studies, like we did in SAFE, I think uh, it's useful for one context. But if I was to design an album versus saline or crystalloid study um, in, those, in surgical patients, I think a cluster study like that uh, with some kind of adaptive or factorial element would be interesting. And, and I can see the sense in going as albumin as the so-called gold standard colloid because it's, it's certainly in our country it's wildly expensive. It's 100 times more expensive than crystalloids. So, but that's, you know, that's, that's, be, that's a key question, Monty. Yeah. It's, a key, it's a key question. And if you don't see any, any, any difference... Yeah. You know, and, and you know, within terms of restrictive or liberal strategies, which have been now validated or tested in, yeah. in, um, in the relief trial, you then ask the question. I mean, if you don't, aren't producing the definable patient deductions or benefits, um, then your, your question is sort of answered. Yes. So the last thing, John, um, what, what did you – I know you wrote the editorial related to it, but for those people who ne- haven't necessarily had time to read the editorial yet, uh, shame on them. The, um, the, 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 the Vanderbilt trials, these you know, large – uh, in-house cluster randomised trials comparing saline to balanced electrolyte <coughs> solutions. What, what did you make of them? You have referred to the, the fact that they're cool designs, which we all agree with. But what do you think they give us an answer? Yeah, I think they were, they were very, very important trials. I mean, I mean, I've known Andy Shaw for many years. He's a, he's a, he's a, as a part from being a really nice bloke, he's, their group has done some really important work over the years. Um, using their databases and observational trials, pre and post and associations, and they've they've, they've taken it to next level. And I, th- I thought these smart tra- and salted trials were were very, very well designed studies. What I really liked about those trials was the validity of the design, the integrity of their of their processes, the transparency of the reporting, and the honesty of the interpretation. I, I, th- I thought it was an excellent excellent initiative by some very, very good people. And that should be recognised. I and mean, you see so much stuff is done without those parameters of integrity, honesty, transparency, yes. with optimization and changing of those things. And I think the SMART will be these, these two trials were, were outstanding in that point of view. Yes. Yeah. The, the issue with them, of course, comes down to the very, very important issues of, first of all, the action measures, yep. which were in the SMART trial, which was basically the composite endpoint. Yes. Uh, which uh, the makes 31. They quite strongly assert it's patient-centred, mm. and I disagree with that somewhat, because the major driver of that process, in fact, was mortality and creatinine levels, uh, and the major driver of the difference, in fact, was the creatinine level differences. I think that was a pragmatic outcome measure that they chose for their trial design, and the signal was important. Secondly, the trial was unblinded, and I think that does raise questions of ascertainment bias, and that's not a criticism of the investigators or the trial design, it's pragmatic, but there's no doubt that that does cause an issue, um, even though you've got a very powerful trial. And the third thing was done within the context of one major US centre, yes. where we basically had two big ICUs. That model is very different to the rest of the world. Now, I hate criticising trials to be negative. I think the trial is excellent. 
the effect size and what we saw were impressive. Yes. There's no doubt about that. And in fact, in fact that does now raise questions about whether or not the use of saline in these patients is safe and effective. We, you know, we're running the, uh, the PLUS study now in Australia, and uh, the Brazilians are running the basic study in, um, in Brazil, and we're going well in these trials. Yes. And we sat down with our groups, asked the question, should we continue our trials yes. in the event of the publication of these two very important trials? discussed it long and hard and we've come to the conclusion that more information is necessary to answer this, whether or not this is a true thing. I have no doubt that the PLUS study in Australia and New Zealand and the Brazil study will add to the to the power and the, the signal. In a couple of years' time we'll have a different advantage. The SMART study, particularly in the ICU patients, the ED study was less robust for a variety of reasons, we'll coming down to how these patients were defined. But I think uh, the, this important trial needs to heighten the acuity of, of clinicians to ask the question. And it does need to, you know, have to ask the question whether or not you know, exposing patients to large volumes of saline who may be at risk of renal failure to be done. In my interview, which you can listen to online with Andy, and I was hoping to triangulate this, and we'll try and do that at, at a later stage with a, and maybe a larger group than just a triangle. Um, I, I'm provocatively, like you say, with regards to giving people hydroxyethyl starch, have for a number of years said, well, what, what do you do when you go to consent the patient about putting them in the saline arm? Do you, because you have to turn around and say, no one's demonstrated that this is more effective. No one's demonstrated that this is safer. There are concerns that it may hurt your kidneys and may increase your chance of dying. So why, why do you want me to be in this limb? Where's, where's the gain? Where's the, where's the, hypothesis, where's the hypothesized benefit of the saline? I know people well, say well, it's right, the most commonly used solution. That, to me, is not an excuse. You know, that, that, that. I agree. I, I agree. And I, and, I, and I think that um, up until the publication of the SMART studies or yeah. Andy studies or Vanderbilt studies, that question was totally unknown. I thought some of the almost evangelical you know, comments about the Salon were overstated. Yes. They were based on small studies, animal studies, pre- and post-studies, observational trials, and I thought that the, 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 the reaction people was, was overstated. I hear their concerns, and I yeah. thought, well, the answer is to, 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 to do a trial. The interesting, interesting thing was is that if you look at our fluid trip study, looking at patterns yes, of practice yes. over the last, between face and chest, there's been a huge swing uh, away from colloids and a huge swing away from saline. Yes. Based on what I would call intermediate level data and I would also say the opinions of people who make a lot of noise. Yes. And perhaps the influence of marketing. Yeah. So already there's been a, a clinical shift in use. I would suspect that Vanderbilt trials will add to that, that change in practice. I think the, the Vanderbilt trials now add a lot more fidelity to that opinion. Uh, I don't believe it's the final word. So I would tell people to consider that practice carefully and wait until the publication of the, uh, the PLUS and the basic study. This is a brief comment. Um, yeah. We excluded patients with bone injury from our study, our yes. study yeah, because of our concerns of hypertonicity. Yeah, and that's a, gen- um, that's a genuine and, concern. Uh, yeah. But the basic study and in Brazil is including patients with TBI. Okay, so that will be and so that, so that, informative. So that question will be answered as well. And that, that, in fact, may add some more insight into the relative impact of hypothalamicity on brain injury. Yeah. So look, if the, the fluid space, to use a, to use a pun, a uh, lot's happening. I mean, over the last decade, don't your meetings, we've seen the whole thing change enormously. Um, and I think we should just be happy and excited that, that very good people are doing very good research around the world on an annual basis, and it's yeah. a fascinating area. So just to uh, inform you, Jai, I showed you we did some, a formal poll. In other words, we posted one, and we had about 125, 130 votes about the uh, is the saline versus balance question dead, and I'll show you the results of that in a second. But we also had, mm-hmm. during the colloid crystalloid one, at the end there was a hand vote in the room, and the room was pretty, pretty packed, a few hundred people in there, mm-hmm. and there were very few hands went up that they were still using colloids. Now, I'm suspicious there are actually a lot more people in the room who do, but it's become a bit embarrassing to yeah. admit to it in public. It was a bit like uh, around the time of the Cochrane meta-analysis, no one would admit to ever giving a patient albumin, which we know is not true. Pretty much everyone has. Yeah. Um, but that's quite an interesting change in, in culture, at least, even if, even, and your survey would suggest in practice. The result of the poll was that 59% of people thought that the saline versus balance question had been dealt with, but that's quite a Brexit vote. You know, that means overall 41% were a, a no or a maybe. So it seems as though the... 
the voters there believe that the trials are, you know, still need doing. There are still unanswered questions. Uh, so congratulations on your endeavours. Keep going. Keep at it, John, and everyone who's doing it. And we'll debate this further. We always look forward to it. We thought, we can, we thought these things were going to be over a long time ago, but I'm sure we'll be retiring with the debates ongoing. Now, John, uh, Henley, the, the, tell us a little bit about Henley, just very briefly in closing. That a lot of people, we have listeners in 90 countries around the world, from Australia to Zimbabwe, so we sometimes talk about things that people haven't got a clue what we're talking about. What goes on at Henley? Oh, okay, well, Henley is uh, one of the oldest uh, rowing regattas in the world. It's, uh, uh, it's very prestigious. Uh, it was the first, the start of the first Oxford Cambridge boat race, in fact, um, uh, down the Henley Reach, uh, and uh, it's become um, a mecca for, for, for rowers to go and race. Uh, I was lucky to row there in three campaigns and, and, and to actually win a race there, I win an event there many years ago. But it is an extraordinarily exciting place to go. It is, it is a Georgian regatta. The, the, the technology is still very much based around the whole Georgian culture. People dress up in their fine finery. Uh, there's big box of pims and champagne. But all that sort of fight show aside, the hardest racing you've done on the track. And I was, extraordinary. So it, I if was, you go to the yeah. Henley Regatta website and you can see all the races on YouTube, um, <laughs> have a look at the uh, St. Paul's race, the Princess Elizabeth, have a look at the men's and women's eights and the uh, single skulls. And uh, if that doesn't make your appetite to go Henley one year on the bucket list, then nothing more. Quint- quintessentially English. And I was lucky enough to go out there with you for a, a, a little bit of a sit around and watch some races. And we found a big silver cup there, as you say, with Myberg J on it. So well done, John. <laughs> John Myberg, from, I will. thank you. You're welcome, Monty. Thanks for downloading and listening to Top Med Talk. Don't forget to find us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, even got our own YouTube channel. Whichever your favourite social media feed is, we're bound to be there. Find us. Also, subscribe to this podcast so that you never miss an episode. And make sure you go to the Top Med Talk website, topmedtalk.com, and get on board with the email updates. Oh, whilst you're at it as well, I suggest you download our entire back catalogue. We're categorising at the moment. We're having a little look through it. It may not always be in the form that you currently find it. So if you get your hard drive ready for a full-on download via the website, perhaps, or perhaps through your podcatcher. Oh, and if you fancy meeting us, why not go to the website, ebpom.org forward slash meetings. Our next big event is EBPOM USA, the Dallas Masters course, a perioperative care practicum. Have a look for details of that and some of the other meetings coming up across the next year. EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.